Good afternoon, everyone. I am Carl Lejway. I'm the provost here at Stony Brook. I'm also a professor in the Department of Psychology and Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And I am really excited today to welcome you uh, for one of our 2023 Provost Lecture Series. And this is a particularly special one as we get to welcome Dr. John Budin back to campus after 42 years. In 1981, he received, and this is, you're hearing right what I'm about to say, his MS in Marine Environmental Sciences from what is now our School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. So of course that's a natural pathway into psychiatry and behavioral sciences. And he earned his medical degree in psychiatry from Tel Aviv University Sackler and went on to have a long and successful career practicing in New York City. He's focused much of his time on destigmatizing mental health disorders, especially as they affect mental health practitioners. This is an area that we have just not paid enough attention to, and it has an enormous impact on our society, and we can sometimes forget that practitioners are people too. They have their own emotions, they have their own experiences, and as we forget about that and the, the dehumanization that can happen when we forget that, it actually impacts the quality of care that our patients then receive. And so you have this cycle that it really takes brave, thoughtful individuals to be willing to intervene and say, hey, this is important. We have to pay attention to this. This is the right thing to do. And we are really grateful for this amazing work that he's done. And he's drawn upon his own experience with bipolar disorder, which he's experienced well into his adulthood. He's uh, going to share the story with you today. He shared it with numerous audiences. And he's done so much other work to not just bring his story forward, but to have impact on policy and guidelines and the way that we approach mental health, doing a lot of work, among other places, sitting on the board of the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. So I very much look forward to hearing from him today. I know this is going to be a great conversation. And he is particularly looking forward to the Q&A. And so start thinking about your questions. And we're going to have a great time. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Buden. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. So a few years back, there was a Broadway show called Next to Normal about a mother living with uh, worsening bipolar disorder. And a song entitled Light, she sings, we waited far too long. In darkness, we searched for morning's dawn. We hoped to be made right. We all need the morning light. The world we thought we knew, the light made it all look new, illuminating each and every day. We will find the will and find our way. So my name is John Buden, and it is a pleasure to be back here after so many years on Stony Brook campus. I wanted to thank all of those who have been involved in bringing me here today, and a particularly shout out to Marissa Campbell, who really led the way of me being here today. So thank you very much, um, Marissa. So I'm a psychiatrist with a practice in New York City, and I also am a psychiatric patient, because I have bipolar disorder. So I've come to find myself on both sides of the proverbial psychiatric couch. I think we make sense of our lives and the lives of others through our stories, so I'm going to share mine with you today. And mine is a story of some denial and regret, but it's also a story of some relief and comfort and humor and humanness. But mostly mine is a story of the voices or the narratives in my head. So my early childhood imprints originated in a home where there was a lot of stiff upper lips. The expectation was to keep our emotions inside and to soldier on. We weren't supposed to have moods, much less wild mood swings. And I learned that looking to others for support and help was frowned upon, so I became an independent, self-sufficient kid. It was like living in a castle with the drawbridge pulled up, wandering around by myself behind really thick, impregnable walls. 
My mother I came to see later when I was a psychiatrist. I look back and she had recurrent episodes of major depressive disorder. So I was expected to be her caregiver. My own desire for comfort was secondary to taking care of her as she navigated through her own you know, lonely castles. And so for me, this all made a really for a potent brew of me distancing myself from my own feelings, presenting myself as not needing comfort or care, believing that intimacy and vulnerability were problematic, and placing the needs of others above my own. So this was the perfect storm that would lead to devastating consequences for me down the road. Early in my career, I was treating patients with depression and bipolar disorder, but amazingly, it never really occurred to me that I was ill. I mean, I had moods and bad days, but I thought, well, everyone did. It certainly never occurred to me that I had a biologically based brain disease. Astonishingly, I couldn't be bombarded with mood symptoms and suicidal thoughts in the morning and then hospitalized patients later that day who had exactly the same symptoms that I did. My mood symptoms, particularly early on in the course of my illness, were not all that noticed because they were milder back then, though they exacerbated over the course of the, my, my mood journey. But I was a master at secreting my feelings away. It was like I was in my own witness protection program. There were times I couldn't contain my euphoric exuberance or my quiet, depressed withdrawal, but in large measure, what was going on inside of me remained invisible to others. Perhaps if I had acted on my suicidal thoughts or my hypomanic episode had ended up in a hospitalization, things would have turned out very differently for me, but that wasn't, that wasn't the case. And in the height of irony, I was actually known as the guy who had the level head and the dispenser of really sound advice. It kind of mystifies me how I functioned during those years without receiving treatment. I mean, how is it possible that I navigated my way through college and then graduate school here and then medical school and then ran big hospital-based programs and established a successful private practice? How was I able to do all that at the same time having bipolar disorder and for many of those years untreated bipolar disorder? You know, was my capacity to avoid reality and to compartmentalize my illness that great? And the answer is yes, actually, it was that great. On one level, I can't really explain how I could have avoided psychiatric treatment for so long, but my bipolar closet door remained firmly shut for a very long time, and I have come to respect the power of closet doors. I think we all have closet doors. We keep those painful things, the overwhelming things, the disturbing things, the shameful things. We keep all these things inside. And then what we do is we drink and we drug and we spend and we sex. We try hard to outrun our inner storm clouds, but that effort is usually a futile one. And we end up being intoxicated and drugged and poor and oversexed. We attempt to flee from ourselves, but only end up intoxicated but by doing so, I had no awareness that I was hurtling forward to really terrible events after which treatment became the only viable choice for me. In retrospect, I began to cycle up and down in college, and while my depressive periods would typically last uh, a couple of months, which is not unusual, my hypomanic periods were of briefer duration. At some point during my psychiatry residency, I began to prescribe myself antidepressants. Many doctors who have psychiatric disorders do this. Um, this was really a terrible decision, one which I came to deeply regret down the road. As many of you know, antidepressants can precipitate manic episodes and can worsen bipolar disorder. And so that is exactly what happened with me. But since I was in denial of my hypomanic episodes and therefore in denial of my bipolar diagnosis, I was oblivious to the consequences to self-prescribe. So this self-sufficient kid had once again become his own psychiatrist in his effort to hide his psychopathology yet one more time. So back then I used really poor judgment and in so doing I exacerbated the course of my illness. My depressive periods would typically last a couple of months. Depression was really physical illness for me. I'd walk more slowly, I'd feel exhausted, I'd nap during the day, I'd have slower thoughts and impaired concentration. 
I'd be unable to exercise despite the fact that I was telling all my patients who were depressed to do just that. I'd have suicidal thoughts that would persist in endlessly ruminative loops. But I never acted on suicidal thoughts because I couldn't bear to imagine the aftermath of my suicide on those around me. Though my periods of depression were painful and were longer lasting, my hypomanic periods actually got me into a lot more trouble. When hypomanic, it's like my brain is hijacked. It's like it's taken over by a flood of neurotransmitters that transport me to places I haven't asked to go. It's like being stra strapped into that rocket ship on Disneyland Space Mountain, except I didn't buy a ticket for that ride. I have thoughts I'd never have in my right mind propelled into actions that my sane self would never do. Oh, silence your cell phones, okay? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Oh boy. Um, um, I have thoughts that I'd have, uh, that I'd never have in my right mind um, if I weren't hypomanic. It's like being taken against my will to a place I no longer knew. I lose my footing, my, my perspective, and my moral compass. It's like my brain is on fire and it burns with ecstatic, you know, sort of agitation. And something we don't talk about frequently enough, but hypersexuality is a really important part of being manic and hypomanic. And so um, I had insatiable, sort of out of control sex, meaningless sex. It was like I wanted to orgasm again and again, but it was never satisfying. And it was like, I was like a crack addict searching for that perfect erotic high, but there was no perfect erotic high in the uh, hypomanic world that I was in. So I found hookup after hookup and repeatedly indulged. It was like I was insatiable. And though I was showing up for work and functioning every day, on the inside, I was on fire. The times I knew that I had lost my mind were never during a hypomanic episode. It was only when I was euthymic that I realized in retrospect that I had lost touch with reality. When I was in it, I felt extremely compostmentous in questioning my behaviors, my decisions to have sex or to have business plans or to write novels or to spend money, all of that were in my mind quite enlightened and worthy of great admiration. So this all came to a halt. I was prescribing myself an antidepressant and I was in the midst of one of the most uh, intense hypomanic periods I had ever had. I was sexually promiscuous and disinhibited and I threw caution to the wind yet another time for yet another hookup. So the grossly impaired judgment that had always accompanied my hypomanic episodes had once again catapulted me forward, but this time it was one time too many. After I arrived, I was held against my will, and then I was sexually assaulted. And even though I was in an altered mood state, I knew at the time that something horrible was happening. So before speaking today, I wondered whether I should share this with you. And I decided that I would. I mean, I could have said, you know, bad things happened. But um, sanitizing reality would have been doing the same thing that I've always done, which is to hide my truth away and secret what shouldn't be secreted anymore. It's important for me to claim full ownership of my story without embarrassment and without shame. And though it's not easy to talk about, think about this. If my untreated bipolar disorder carried me to the place that it did, imagine where thousands and thousands and thousands of clinicians right now who have untreated psychiatric illnesses are being carried to. Too many of them are living right now as I was with walls of shame that feel unscalable, trapped in silence. And it was only when my hypomania burned out 10 days later that the trauma of knowing not just what I had done, but who I had become really engulfed me. And I knew at that point that my life's trajectory had to change. But really, how could I forgive myself? How could I ever reconcile the guy who values decency and fidelity, health and safety with the guy that acted contrary to all those basic traits? So my journey toward acceptance and reconciliation, both as a patient and as a psychiatrist, began with the no longer possible to ignore reality of my diagnosis. My health, my safety, my, my marriage, my career, all of these were at risk. I could no longer keep my that bipolar closet door nailed firmly shut and deny that which was any longer deniable. So the choice for me became either 
to get treatment or I was going to uh, destroy my life. There was no place to hide. I simply couldn't run anymore. So a few weeks later, I walked into the office of the psychiatrist that I continue to see to this day, and it was no question the most humbling journey aspect of my whole mental health journey. I needed him, and that was really um, pissing me off. I was a psychiatrist. It was like I was a psychiatrist committing a patient against his will to treatment, but awfully that patient was me. Um, seeing him for the first time, it felt like I was some Top Gun autopilot, but I was now being forced to sit and coach. I had to submit to care, and I really felt uh, humiliated. And when he recommended the dreaded L word, lithium, in the first session, I cringed, but I wasn't surprised. I mean, after all, the first thing I said to him when I sat down in this office chair was, I have bipolar disorder. Down the road, when he added a fourth medication to my regimen, an antipsychotic, I again had to surrender, um, but this time to the reality of my lack of reality. That it was being used as an antidepressant and a mood stabilizer didn't really matter to me. I now felt like I fell into the category of those who had stepped over the line that separates the insane folks like me from everyone else. Swallowing my pride those days were much more tough, much more difficult than swallowing the handful of pills that I did. So I'm currently prescribed an antidepressant, two mood stabilizers, and an anxiolytic. It took my psychiatrist almost a year and a half to stabilize me, and while that's not unusual, it really kind of sucked. I had finally agreed to treatment, and yet I didn't feel any better, and to boot, I was having side effects necessitating endless medication and dosage changes. The only reason I actually stayed in treatment at that point was because I had no choice. I knew where untreated bipolar disorder was likely going to take me again. So I took my meds, I got my blood drawn, I kept my appointments, and I just soldiered on. And after this period of a year and a half, the fog finally lifted and my moods were in a good place. With a lot of help from him, I did it, and I've continued to be quite stable since then. But accepting my diagnosis raised some really uncomfortable questions for me. Um, as a psychiatrist with bipolar disorder, I wondered about my professional work. Had my illness ever influenced the care I'd given my patients in problematic ways? When I was hypomanic or depressed, did I say something or do something? Did I prescribe something or fail to prescribe something that was influenced by my mood disorder? Did I always keep my internal world so secreted away? I try as hard to be as honest as I can with myself. I don't ever remember looking back after returning to a euthymic state thinking that I would have handled the situation differently. But it begs the question, do my patients want a psychiatrist with, a, with bipolar disorder? Would I want my psychiatrist to have bipolar disorder? Do I have an obligation to inform my patients that I have bipolar disorder? These are difficult questions, and I think reasonable people may disagree. On the one hand, practicing is a privilege. It's not a right. And competent patient care is really paramount. This trumps everything else. But on the other hand, if we don't allow those caregivers with illness to be freely open and encourage them to seek care without fear of retribution, we simply back, drive them back behind their own closet doors. Many states in the U.S. ask unfairly broad questions on applications for medical licensure, such as, have you ever been treated with a mental health, for a mental health condition? So any physician who has ever had an anxiety disorder, a mood disorder, a, an emotional problem of some kind or another, places renewal of their license in peril if they answer those questions honestly. Physicians who have no current mental health symptoms are expected to put their vocation and their livelihood at risk. So instead of lowering the barriers and making it easier to seek treatment, all this does is raise them, I think. And how can this really be helpful? I think the fair question to ask on medical license applications is, are, or, is or are ones that attempt to answer the question, do current mental health symptoms impact one's ability to do their job at that particular time. I just read this morning that three senators had submitted a letter to the Department of Justice, which oversees state medical boards, speaking exactly about this, that physicians are in trouble and that 
state medical licensing boards are often viewed as being punitive rather than helpful by many doctors. And that's my experience uh, as well. So there may be those amongst you who believe that I should have stopped practicing entirely, but I don't think that that is really the answer given that so many of us are in need of treatment. I think that helping practitioners receive the care that they need is the best thing that we can do. So I decided to disclose that I had bipolar disorder when I was still practicing, and my greatest concern at the time was the reaction my patients were going to have if they became aware of my diagnosis. I mean, if you Google me, it's the first thing that comes up, depression and bipolar disorder, depression and bipolar alliance, physician with uh, bipolar disorder. So I concluded that for some patients it really wouldn't matter and for some others it might even feel I would be, that I would be more understanding and empathic towards them. But there was no question at all in my mind that some patients might be impacted in a detrimental way. Some might not want to see a psychiatrist who had bipolar disorder and that is very understandable and that is very okay. But it was a sobering realization because we physicians live by the credo, do no harm. So despite this, I chose to disclose my diagnosis and did so in a very public way at the International Society of Bipolar Disorders Conference. And over the last three years, I've told my story at the American Psychiatric Association at their annual conference. And I do these things because I feel that there's a greater good in stepping forward and that outweighs the possible negative repercussions that might occur now, other clinicians might have made a different choice, and I totally understand that. But if I had to do it all over again, I would do the same thing, I think. So I raise more questions here with you than I answer, and that is as it should be. As I said, these are difficult questions, and dialogue is long overdue and is much needed. It was only when I arrived at a place of bipolar stability with multiple medications and a therapeutic lithium level that I was able to ask myself what healing might look like for me. And to answer that question, I had to begin with the narratives that were swirling around in my head. The voices that we all have in our heads can create different narratives. And my narratives gave rise, give rise to two storylines, one of which is true and the other is not. For me, there had always been a loud, persistent, shame, harsh narrative attached to my mood disorder. And like a Greek chorus, it would enter stage left and stage right proclaiming with an oration that I was weak and sick and damaged and perverse and worthy of contempt and cowardly and immoral and all those things. And this narrative was harsh and cruel, but importantly, the narrative was untrue. But back then I was ruled by fearful voices that resulted in me withdrawing from the reality of what was going on in my personal life and in my brain. I had been mistaken in believing that some external prison warden somewhere held the keys to my freedom. I was waiting around to be paroled for a crime that I didn't commit. I thought that what imprisoned me professionally were the real life consequences that would come my way if my story were to become known. Collegial disapproval, loss of my medical license, and those sorts of things. And let's be honest, these internal voices, these internal harsh judgmental voices were amplified by a professional culture that lauds us doctors and clinicians broadly uh, uh, to be uber competent and stoic. We expect ourselves to soldier on despite the unacceptably heavy burden that we carry. The intense pressures to perform can be dehumanizing and have an unintended effect of battering our psyches. And while we do an excellent job, I think, of treating our patients with kindness and respect, we don't often bestow that enough on ourselves. So physician heal thyself becomes advice that is unattainable. It's no wonder that our rates of mood, anxiety, substance disorders, and suicidal and suicide are so high. I believe that shame only survives in the dark, and when we secret our truth away, when we are silent, we are confirming that we are worthy of shame. But what is unspoken and what remains unspoken feels over time sometimes like it can be unspeakable. So I had to reclaim a different narrative, one that unlike the shame narrative actually happens to be true. So for you to understand a little bit about this journey, I'll have to tell you just a few stories that taught me some surprising and unforgettable lessons. 
After my psychiatrist stabilized my mood, a woman with bipolar disorder came in to see me for consultation. And while my mood was in a really good place, I still felt ashamed um, as, a, as a doctor having bipolar disorder. So she shared her story with me, and it was remarkably similar to mine, years of self-loathing and fleeing from her diagnosis. But I felt that it was a privilege to be invited into her inner world, and I empathized with her struggles. And rather than seeing her as damaged, I saw her merely as being scared. And rather than seeing her as pathological, I saw her as being vulnerable. It was her humanness that resonated with me. And then what had previously been blind to me became clear and in focus. We humans can have kindness and compassion for others that we don't often enough bestow upon ourselves. And I thought that surely I could find a way to rewire the way that I spoke with myself, replacing the voices of self-condemnation with ones imbued with self-affirmation and humanism. So it sounds really obvious back then, but back then it felt like it was really revelatory. So I learned to have more compassion for myself. We have a saying in the world of mental health that growth happens when we lean into discomfort. By definition, growth is a journey where we enter into a new world. Whether we are stumbling to learn a new language or falling off our bike as a kid, Leaning into the discomfort of showing one another our tender core, for example, is as challenging as it is rewarding. But ironically, it's only through embracing this discomfort that we can truly find comfort. In other words, we can't have it both ways. We either live behind thick, impregnable walls, protecting ourselves, feeling alone, or we open up to the joy and the pain in life by feeling uneasily vulnerable. When we say, I love you first, when we stand up at an AA meeting and say, I'm an alcoholic, or when we say, I need your help, we are extending our hands and opening our hearts. I think we humans are hardwired to connect and being openly vulnerable is the only pathway to true intimacy and well-being. So I learned to accept as best I can my human vulnerability. Early in my career as a resident psychiatrist, I was taught a lesson from a patient with bipolar disorder who urinated on herself. Back then, I had no idea what I was doing when I was a resident. I was really quite incompetent. And one day, I was facilitating a group on an inpatient unit. That was going pretty well, until a woman with bipolar disorder suddenly stood up, walked to the center of the room, stared right at me, and started to urinate. I watched. It was like speechless and in horror. I had no idea what to do as the urine trickled down her leg. So I sat in my chair mute. I hadn't the slightest clue what to do, and yet I felt publicly humiliated in front of the staff, my supervisors, and all the other patients. Since she and I shared the same diagnosis, I briefly drifted into my own thoughts. I wondered, wow, is this my future? Hospitalizations and urinating in public. So I spoke with her later that day, and in her own psychotic case, she shared with me that the psychiatry resident who had cared for her had rotated off the unit the day before I arrived, and I had taken his place. She missed him, she liked him, and most importantly felt that he cared about her. And she was scared that I was going to leave her too. So I got it. While I have learned to express my fears in ways that don't involve public urination, she was making me face the reality that in addition to our shared diagnosis, we actually were more similar than we were different. We both felt vulnerable, we both felt afraid, we both felt inadequate. Neither of us were in control, and it turns out I wasn't always the master of my universe. So I learned to accept my humanness. Many years ago, there was a mathematician named Edward Lorenz who worked on models to predict weather systems. And he would use extremely exacting numbers and run his programs repeatedly analyzing the results. So one day, he put in numbers that were rounded off in seemingly inconsequential ways. And he was startled to find out that the very tiny change in the initial numbers created huge differences in the experiment's outcome. This is what we have come to know as the butterfly effect. It means minor perturbations, such as the metaphorical flapping of the wings of a butterfly, can affect the hurricane occurring halfway around the world. 
That's to say, small acts can have big effects. So why did you hug your daughter yesterday? What was the reason you gave your college students a pop quiz last week? Why did you take your medications today? Why did you encourage your son with depression to go to his support group? Well, because you wanted to show your child that you love them, because you were trying to impart knowledge to young minds, because you wanted to be adherent to your own recommended care, and you wanted to help and support your son. I think that's all true, but I think it's all missing the point. We act in these ways because of the effects these actions have, not just on that day, but in the future. We hope that our daughters will live, li will live lives knowing love. We hope that our students will go do good deeds in life with the wisdom that we impart. We do these things even though the effects may not be apparent until down, far down the road. And here's the even bigger thing. We do these acts even though we may never see the positive outcomes that may arise from our good deeds. So our small acts today can have big effects tomorrow. We can't always see that the hug, the quiz, the meds, or the support will result in anything wondrous, but we hope and we have faith that it will. Perhaps without realizing, we hope that our actions will play some small part in leaving our world in a better place. So we try to be butterflies. Have faith that you will usher in the winds of a better tomorrow for us all. So I learned that small acts today can have big effects tomorrow. But what finally allowed me to heal fully was this. When I was little, I was sure that there were monsters under my bed and when I was sleeping at night. And I imagined that when my parents might come into the room and they'd flip the lights on, my eyes would squint from the harshness of the bulb. And now growing up, I've always I've wondered about what we can see in ourselves when our lens is a bit tinged with darkness and when our lens is filled with light. How do we define ourselves? We believe that our identity is seen, I think, when we are being authentic, but I'm not so sure that's the case. Authenticity, in my opinion, is not about being, it is about doing. Authenticity is an active choice, it's not a passive process. So we aren't authentic because we feel we're, we're an honest person, for example. We're authentic because we do honest acts. Authenticity is about authoring our own story. It's a wonderful thing to be authentic because we are always at every moment just one action away from our truest self. Authenticity is hope-filled and empowering, knowing that we are in charge of our affirmations and our aspirations each day. Authenticity allows us to dream, to record our humanity, and to be our better selves. So when it's dark, it's true we can see monsters under our bed, but remember in the dark of the night, we can also see the stars that illuminate the sky. And when the light is suddenly switched on, it's true we can shield our, our eyes from the harshness, but remember, in the light of day, we can also see our loved ones smile. So the final little lesson I learned was this. It wasn't just that really small acts today can have big effects on others tomorrow. It was that these acts needed to be authentic acts. And here's what finally worked for me. It wasn't that I wrote my story. It wasn't that I've told my story. It wasn't that my story was depicted in a documentary film. What finally allowed me to arrive at a place of peace, acceptance, wellness, and humanity is embodied in a few words, words that provide the compass for my true north, words that I'd ask you to consider thinking about in your own life. Live your authentic story. Small authentic acts today will have big effects, effects on others tomorrow, and these true actions will carry you in the direction of your best self. There are times, no question, that I have my darker moments and I find my shame narratives in my head rising up. These days, though, I'm more persistent than they are, and I recognize that healing requires an ongoing effort. And if we can just find our way to that healthy narrative place, it's easier to find our way back if we tend to lose our way. If a blind man is given sight for a day and then becomes blind again, what he saw can't be unseen. So when we've tasted the strength and comfort that comes from reclaiming our healthy story, we can't ever unfeel it, we can't unthink it, and we can't ever forget. As I pursue my more, my more authentic self, I know that life can carry me, despite my best efforts to resist, to places I'd rather not go. Internal forces and external life events 
can propel me into dir in directions that leave me no choice other than to surrender to a reality that I cannot control. I now know, for example, that I have no sway over my brain's unmedicated neurotransmitters and the behaviors that occur if they're out of control. But my efforts to move in the direction of ownership, to come out of the shadow and to embrace my story with compassion and respect, help me find solid footing. So I'm trying hard not to be that self-sufficient kid who's cut off from his own internal emotional world, hiding in the darkness. I'm no longer immersed in shame, living in silence behind those castle walls. I want to finish up by asking those of you who know of a colleague or a trainee currently in the midst of a major depressive episode, or one who might have had manic or anxious symptoms in the past month, or someone perhaps who was quietly hospitalized this past year, I want to, give, I want to ask you to give some thought as to how you can be more helpful to them. Those with mental health conditions have to step forward and engage in treatment to feel better, it's true. But the rest of us must do more to make that journey one that is safer and easier for them. I have heard others say that we all march forward when those who have been suffering in silence speak out, and that is true. But that's only half the solution because I think it needn't be that those of us who have been unwell bear the full responsibility of becoming well. Your colleagues and your friends are in trouble and they need all of you more than you might realize. Please don't underestimate how impactful your words or a hug might be. I like to say that we change the culture of secrecy one conversation at a time. If all of us don't put our compassion into action, the silence will be heard as you do not exist. I have faith that our hearts are in the right place and I have faith that we can summon the fortitude and have the conversations we need to have. I also want to speak to those of you who have mental health conditions and you're being treated currently, which is wonderful, but you've yet to find your voice with loved ones or with close peers. Now you needn't do so until you're ready or you needn't do so ever. But remember, you lift yourself up when you let the rest of us in. Sharing your story is as powerful for you as it is uniting for us. So don't underestimate, as I did, the welcoming and affirming response that you may receive if well-chosen ones in your world truly know you. I have found that there, are that there are few things in life that are more freeing and powerful than authenticity. You likely already have what you need to free yourself, so please consider using your wisdom. Bipolar disorder has been an affliction of my brain, my psyche, and my soul. And for those clinicians listening right now, I want to underline that many, if not most, of your patients living with mental health conditions will not be cured by medication alone. I have facilitated peer-run mood disorder support groups. If your patients struggle with adherence to recommended treatment, have problematic medication side effects, or remain distressed despite symptom remission, allow others living with mood disorders to help you in the good work that you are doing. Great organizations like the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill and the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance have great resources and support groups for those who are living with psychiatric disorders. Before I finish up, I want to share my contact information. I love hearing from others. I love hearing questions and comments and critiques. Um, so please, uh, reach out to me. It's easy to, to remember, it's physicianwithbipolar at gmail.com. So my final words are to those of you who are listening now who are living with a mental health condition and yet you are not being treated. You're lost in scary places and so I'm speaking to you right now. You deserve to feel better, it is your right. Please don't underestimate that many colleagues stand by your side more than you might imagine. You are not alone. Many people, including me, have walked your walk. So I'm reaching out to you in the hopes that maybe it'll make it just a little bit easier for you to step forward towards treatment. And when you do, we can all join together and write new lyrics just for you. I waited far too long. Night after night, I searched for dawn. I hoped to be made right. I saw I needed the morning light. The world I thought I knew, the light now makes it all look new, illuminating each and every day. 
I have finally found the will, and I have finally found my way. So this is my story. This has been my long day's journey in tonight. I want to thank you for listening. I'm happy to hear your thoughts or respond to any questions at all. Please, thanks again. Dr. Budin, thank you so much for that. So we'll take questions at either mic, so because we want to make sure we can hear you. So if you feel comfortable coming up, great. Um, if not, I can bring a mic to you. Uh, hi, my name is Navia. Um, I also have bipolar disorder, bipolar two. Thank you. Um, Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. As soon as I saw that um, you, a psychiatrist with bipolar disorder, was coming to speak, I knew I had to come, and I wanted to say that I could relate actually to a lot of the things that you were saying. I'm in school to go uh, be a social worker, and my Wonderful. placement next semester is going to be at a psychiatric hospital. Wonderful. So <laughs> I, was, I really wanted to come, and I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your story and everything like that, and that really, really touched me. So I appreciate it so much, and thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. Thank you so much, <laughs> and your patients are going to be very lucky. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for sharing this very inspiring story and journey that you've been through. Um, it, it's, it's incredible that you've gone through all this and you've come to this point. Um, I have so many questions, but just to, to start up, I was curious as to what took you into psychiatry. Did you already have some kind of insight and was it a call for trying to maybe figure out what's going on, or was it, you think, just completely a coincidence? So that's a really good question. Um, I think that it was a combination of things. Um, I came to the conclusion that of all the medical specialties, psychiatry by far for me was the most interesting and compelling and captivating. Um, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, um, I'm always drawn to the human condition. Um, now, that being said, I think also that for me to figure out how I ticked myself, psychiatry ended up because of the work, of the nature of the work of being present and connecting with people on a deep level. I think it was a, a good match for me in that way. So. There were, there were many things, but those are two things. Yeah. Uh, if I may, one more. So, so one more question. You know, one difficulty uh, when you live with someone who has bipolar illness, because of the phases of mania that have basically a euphoric component, that it's very difficult to convince the individual to go to treatment or to take the medications because part of that is just letting go of that euphoric feeling of being on top yes. of the world and yes. having the power, the control. It's very, um, it kind of s synergistic with the lack of insight that's part of the illness. So do you have any advice about how could family members bring um, those loved ones to see the, the problem to help, to help them with insight? Mm. That is a really tough question, and I think psychiatry and mental health has been struggling with that for a very long time. One of the, one of the things about psychiatric disorders is that almost by definition, denial of the disorder, unlike other medical conditions, denial of the disorder is almost inherent in some of our psychiatric conditions. Um, what I would say is that um, for me, what really helped was having um, two things happen. I mean, one, I got to the point where I really needed treatment and I was aware of that and I had no choice at that point. But I did have a supportive family, which I was very blessed and you know, lucky to have. Um, I think that multidisciplinary programs are probably the best way to bring people you know, into treatment. But it's a very, very hard thing to ask someone to give up something that makes them feel so unbelievably special and so unbelievably good. 
it was hard for me because when you're elevated in that way, it is a beautiful place to be, you know? When you are flying high and you're the smartest person in the room and you know everything like that, it's a very tough thing to give that up. For me, what happened was the scale ultimately tipped in the direction that there was more damage and destruction than there was, you know, positive. But it's a very tough thing um, in psychiatry. Um, Well, that was actually um, my question, but I have another. <laughs> um, sure. Do you, I was just wondering if you could address the, the, the lack of psychiatrists, the lack of psychiatrists who take insurance, and then the lack of psychiatrists that also do talk therapy. Mm. Mm. Sure. Um, try not to be too politically incorrect here. Um, you can be. <laughs> we'll, we'll turn the cameras off for a second. Um, look, what drives medicine and what drives clinical care is very much not just what's best clinically. What drives it is money and power. And so uh, when we have pharmacy companies and insurance companies who are putting so much power and money into um, treating patients as opposed to having clinicians treat patients, we get into big trouble. Um, and I think that that is what has happened. You know, when you're a psychiatrist and you're reimbursed X number of dollars for a 20 minute visit and maybe not so much more for a 45 minute visit, many psychiatrists will opt to choose the 20 minute session. And it's really unfortunate because psychiatrists are so perfectly trained in some ways to have mixed treatments of talk therapy and medication therapy. But the influence of big business is very problematic. Um, I wish I had an answer for that. Two related questions. What would have happened if you had been treated earlier and was it really your own steam that got you into treatment, or had been people had people been pleading with you all along, please, 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 and you finally heard it? Um, I definitely was hearing voices, not voices, voices, um, from those around me uh, who were saying that they were recognizing my moods were becoming increasingly problematic and problematic for them. These were people close in my life, like my husband and you know, uh, family members. But I resisted that for a long time. Had I gotten treatment earlier, I think my life would have taken a much better course. I think I would have been known as a psychiatrist early in my career who has bipolar disorder, had I owned it, gotten treatment, owned it, and felt okay about it. And that would have been a very different experience for me as a psychiatrist. I came out of the mental health closet relatively late in my career. And I, if I had anything to do over again, it would be that I would have come out of that closet early so that I could be a practicing psychiatrist known to have bipolar disorder um, throughout my entire career. I think that would have been very, not only interesting and compelling, but maybe helpful in a better way or in a bigger way. Hi, um, Hi. my name is Lucy. I'm also in um, the master's in social work program with Synavia, and I second what she said, that I was really excited to see that this um, talk was happening, because um, I feel like it's really important. Um, and my question is, Thank you. Um, within um, social work training, what I feel like is a really crucial part of our learning is process recordings, where we do a lot of self-reflecting on just how interactions with like clients that we see make us feel, or things that it might have brought up. And I was curious, because I don't have background in psychiatry, is there anything similar that um, psychiatry training has where there's an opportunity to kind of 
process and do self-reflection because I would be curious if that's encouraged and if so, like what the process is like. Hmm. Well, there, there may be others who could answer that better than I can these days because when I went to medical school, it was a long time ago and we didn't have much of that you know, going on. But not as much as we need, yes, yes. No, the question was, do, I need to, do we need to be in therapy during medical school or during psychiatry residency? And the answer is no. I mean, I was. I did an analysis back then, and I've seen therapists over the years, and obviously I see a psychiatrist right now. It, it's, it's not a requirement. Do I think it's helpful? Yes, absolutely. For most folks, it is. Um, but it's not a requirement as far as I know these days for most programs. Hi, um, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your story. Cause, thank you. Uh, like, I don't know if I will speak long, and I don't know if it's okay, but since I'm a student who came here like three months ago from South Korea, and I'm studying um, computer science in a graduate school, but I got to be diagnosed as an ADHD like a month before I came here, so like, yeah, I graduated like civil engineering course in Korea and then I came here, but then, yeah, like I've been four months of, eight. I, I knew that I was AD, I have, I am diagnosed of ADHD four months ago and I was ADHD since I was a baby. Anyway, so. Well, thank um, you, for, thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you for sharing, you for sharing. and um, um, the reason why I wanted to say thank you was that like your words resonated a lot of my mind, and like normally I'm introvert ADHD, but I'm so excited to like hear someone saying exactly the same thing. So yeah, I was so real. Um, I got a condolence kind of, and even when you're talking about the sad narratives, I deeply appreciate it because like. Some, there is someone sp speaking about me instead of me. And like when you're saying that like um, when you're in a good mood, you feel like you're the smartest and like you can't lose. You don't want to lose that feeling. And that explains the reason why I diagnosed so late, even though I was thinking that I was ADHD since before. But anyway, so thank you for that. Um, could you help me to get the tip to find it, make it easier to find a fit psychiatrist? Like, I need to look for the psychiatrist here and like. Sure, I'll tell you what, how about after I finish here, let me just talk with you personally, uh, privately, okay? Yeah, thanks. We'll do that. Thank you. Hi there, I, I, first off I'd like to say, I totally respect what you did. Um, it's a hard thing. Thank you. And it, and it really needs to be done. Um, I'd like you to see if you could address the HIPAA law with regards to mental illness, and maybe it doesn't need to be changed. Um, my daughter was hospitalized twice. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's okay. And, and in dealing with the, the psychiatrist, she's had a couple. And her one that she was really, really doing well with had too many patients left to practice. Got stuck with somebody else, doing the Zoom thing, um, and kind of slid back. Called their office to see if we can talk to a patient advocate, you know, maybe they could talk to the doctor. And, but my daughter's very private about it, doesn't want to talk, you know, doesn't want us involved with it. But they don't ask people um, what's going on in their life, you know. They don't get any feedback from us. So she has, she's doing okay, but she's not self-sufficient anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and we can't talk to the doctor. So that's just, that's my question. Right, you, mean, you can't talk to the doctor because you're saying that there are HIPAA violations in doing that? She, was, she won't give us permission, or oh. the doctor permission to talk to us. She won't give your permission, yeah. That takes us a little, you know, afield, but what I will say is this, that um, 
and others may can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about confidentiality and HIPAA laws in that regard. In other words, and I don't know if this will answer your question or not, um, if I'm seeing someone, um, it's okay for me to hear, hear, receive information from family members, friends, whatever. I can't share information, of course, about the identified person without their permission, but I can hear information. So I don't know if that answers the question. Um, it gets, maybe it's the practice, because we tried calling and we couldn't talk to the doctor and we did talk to a patient advocate in the practice and, and nothing's changed, so I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, okay, well how about this? After we're finished, let me just talk with you so I make sure I understand the um, question just a little bit better and I'm happy to, to spend a little time. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, is Hi. that loud? I hope it's not. Um, my name is Victoria. I just Hi. wanted to thank you for what you're doing here. I find it incredibly important. I have bipolar disorder type two, and the only way that I was able to find early intervention is because when my mom was in college, she saw a guest uh, speaker talk about her life with schizophrenia, and she was convinced to take a mood disorder class. Now, she was a business major. She had no nothing to do with psychology, but it stuck with her for the rest of her life, and once I started struggling and I started exhibiting symptoms, we were able to come together and find a treatment solution, so I just, I resonate with your story greatly, and I appreciate you for what you're doing here. And my question is totally left field and not related to that at all, but how did you find your way from marine science to psychiatry? <laughs> yes. I knew that was going to come up. <laughs> First of all, thanks for sharing. Um, I appreciate that, and I applaud your courage, you know, for doing so. Um, so when I finished um, marine biology school um, here and I got my degree, I went to medical school right away. And what I was thinking is I, I always loved science and I always loved finding answers to questions. And I think that's what drew me to research. But what I felt was lacking for me in a, in a broader way was the interpersonal clinical contact, and that's why I made that turn. But broadly, I think the idea of being inquisitive and curious and wanting to know things and all that resonated very well with me um, when I was here. Hi. Um, first, I wanted to say thank you for sharing your story, and a lot of it resonated with me. About um, a year thank ago, you. I was diagnosed with bipolar 1, and I have a question where it's like, do you ever stop missing the euphoric state, or, you know, like, I, I don't know if that's relevant. Yes. It's a, it's a great question. Um, I don't miss it anymore at all. And the reason is because I looked back on it in a romantic way for a long period of time. But the truth is my euphoria came with irritability and agitation and disruption. And so it wasn't pure euphoria. So I don't look back on that and wish it upon myself these days. I know that many do because it's an incredible feeling but I don't, uh, I don't at this point, and happily so, happily so. I'm, I'm glad I'm, I have that beast put away. Thank you. So we're about to wrap up. I do want to say one thing. I, you used the word shame several times, and I think that is the most intimate, beautiful word, and so few people will use it. I can count on my hands the number of times someone has used that word where they were not forced to say it. And it just brings someone in to where you are and what you were feeling in the most authentic way. There is no bullshit around it. There is no self-preservation. It is just naked and real and raw. And I think it is great for everyone to see someone use it in a way that is so real. And I just wanted to thank you for, mm. for doing that. It's very kind of you to say.
Thank you so much. So thank you, and let's. So thank you very much, guys. You've been great. <laughs>